All right, everybody, this is part two of our um, introduction section here. Let's talk about types of research. So one of the, one of the large um, ways to divide out research is through empirical versus non-empirical research. Empirical research is where we go out and collect new data, and then we analyze that new data and write about it. And that's compared then to non-empirical research where no new data is collected, right? So you may um, write your, well, this semester you're going to write a literature review where you're going to review everything that we know up until today about your topic. So you're not collecting new data, you're reviewing previous data. So a lot of the pages on, on ASHA are going to be, you know, discussions about, you know, this is a summary of what we already know. That's non-empirical research versus empirical research, which is a brand new study, new data, new information um, coming forward. Now we can divide empirical research up into two categories also. One is experimental research, where one or more factors are manipulated. So let's say I want to um, give treatment to preschoolers who stutter, and I divide one group of eight kids up and give them um, one type of therapy, and then I divide, and then I take a second group and I give them a second kind of therapy, right? So I'm manipulating the type of therapy that they receive. Um, and then we're going to see who does better at the end. That's experimental research, where the researcher has done something to manipulate the participants. They, they give them therapy, they, you know, give them treatment, they give them um, something happens to the participants, and then we test them to see the results of that manipulation. Now that's going to be in comparison to non-experimental research. Non-experimental research is the investigation of existing conditions. So if I want to test the difference in language abilities between children who stutter and children who don't stutter, um, who are typical children, that would be non-experimental research. So I'm just giving them a, ta a language test. These kids in group A stutter. These kids in group B are typical. I'm not manipulating anything. I'm not giving them therapy. I'm not doing anything other than assessing them. So that's non-experimental research. I'm investigating how they're doing right now. Okay. And then one more type of exper um experimental research, right, where one or more factors are manipulated, to go one step further, a true experiment meets two criteria. Number one, the researcher manipulates one or more factors, just like we talked about, but then also conditions are determined randomly. So if I took my um, kids who stuttered and I randomly placed them into group A and group B, then it's a true experiment. Right. If I maybe ask the parents which type of therapy they thought their child would do the best in, or if, you know, the first eight people who got to therapy started with this therapy and the last eight people get another therapy. Right. That's not random. So it's not a true. It would still be experimental research, but it's not a true experiment unless participants are determined randomly or placed randomly into different groups. All right, let's talk about variables. We've got independent variables, dependent variables, and extraneous or confounding variables. An independent variable is what the researcher is studying and manipulating, right? So if I'm dividing up the preschoolers who stutter into different groups, um, and then each group gets a different kind of therapy, the independent variable would be type of therapy because group A is getting, you know, therapy number one, group B is getting therapy number two. So the independent variable then will be type of therapy for those kids. 
And the dependent variable is the outcome measure the researcher obtains or the outcome of interest, right? So for that dependent variable, um, maybe in this study, I want to look at percent syllables stuttered. So let's say I'm only interested in counting moments of stuttering, right? That's my dependent variable is at the end of therapy, who has the least amount of stuttering, um, group A or group B, right? So outcome of interest is percent syllable stuttered. And then we have extraneous or confounding variables, and that's an uncontrolled variable that could impact the dependent variable, right? So here we have something else other than the independent variable that could impact the dependent variable. So let's say, just by chance, kids receiving therapy number one um, at the beginning of therapy have a high number of moments of stuttering on the pretest coming into therapy, and kids in the other group start out with already a low amount of stuttering. Well, then maybe one therapy is better than the other, but one group already started out stuttering more than the other, so it's going to be really hard to know which therapy was actually better, right? And then maybe there are kids whose parents are able to work with them at home on, you know, aspects of therapy, kids that whose parents can't do that, kids who are able to, to go to more therapy sessions than others, Right? Maybe there's a difference in the training between the, the therapists themselves in the treat, giving the treatment. So there'd be lots of other variables involved. And one of the jobs of the researcher is to try to know this beforehand and to try to control for as many po variables as they possibly can. Okay. Um, finally, I think we're going to differentiate within our um, experimental research between, um, well, actually, this can be experimental or not experimental. Um, quantitative research, where we're going to use numbers or quantities. Um, so if we're counting, you know, moments of stuttering, that would be quantitative, right? And then qualitative research is really any kind of research that does not involve numbers. So if I wanted to ask the parents, you know, how did you feel your child did before therapy versus after therapy? How did you enjoy the therapy process? Do you think the child gained anything from therapy? And they talked about it, and then we took their answers and put them into themes and overall perspectives. Um, that would be qualitative research. Now, if I decided in my paper that I would use the percent syllable stuttered, which would be quantitative, plus I want to get parental perspective of how the, the therapy process went, that would be mixed research, where I'm using both quantitative and qualitative research to give me the, the answer that I'm looking for. All right, now we're just going to talk a little bit about sources here. Um, anytime we're talking about primary sources, we're talking about research articles. So, um, research articles in journals, usually peer-reviewed, which we'll talk about in a second, that give us, um, you know, whoops, new data, new information. Anything else is secondary. So that could be textbooks, that could be presentations, um, anything that's not primary, the research articles is going to be secondary, a secondary source, because it's not the only primary source is that new um, new data, new information is going to be primary. Quickly about scientific journals. Um, there's a peer review process. Um, well, you can have some journals are peer reviewed, some are not. That can really, what peer reviewed mean can really differ between journals. Um, but peer review in general, right, means that your peers will view, usually three of your peers will review um, you, the articles, the article submitted, um, for publication. Now, you know, you want to have three, usually sometimes it's fewer, um, and the process usually is, so let's say, well, I'm actually a peer reviewer right now for, I think, the Journal of Communication Disorders, and so somebody submitted an article, I don't know who it was, it went to the main editor, um, the article is about stuttering and 
um, uh, stuttering in the workplace. Um, so it went to an editor of the journal Communication Disorders, who I'm sure does not specialize in stuttering. She then sent it to the associate editor, so uh, one editor who specialized in stuttering. That editor read it, found it interesting enough to say, yes, this could go into this journal. Um, she then sent it out to two of us to peer review, me and somebody else, and I don't know who the other peer reviewer is. Um, so in our case, there are only really two reviewers plus the associate editor um, who's going to review that article. Um, so the positive is, right, we've got the associate editor specializes in stuttering. I really specialize in stuttering. I assume the other person who's reviewing specializes in stuttering. So that's three people who's reviewing this article um, to make it better. So what happened was this article came in. Um, again, it went through this process. I reviewed it. Another person reviewed it. Um, we decided that it, it probably is good enough for publication, but that the the researchers have to make some changes. So we told them what the changes were. They then went back, rewrote part of it, um, probably reanalyzed some of the data in a different way, I hope, and have just given it back to us. I just got the second version of it. I haven't looked at it yet. Um, hopefully they've made the changes that we need to make it strong enough to go into the journal. Um, and then maybe it will be published in the winter, right? So, you know, who knows how long ago they actually collected the data. Um, and then they had to write the article and then they sent it in. It went to the editor. It went to the associate editor. She sent it to two of us. We took a month to review it, sent it back to the associate editor, who then sent a letter to the people who wrote it, who then have to spend about three months to rewrite it. Then it just came back to us. It'll take us a month to review it. It'll go back to the associate editor with our reviews. She'll make the final decision. Um, they'll probably still have to make a few minor changes, even if it is accepted, right? So there's a publication lag. So the positive is that, right, it goes through um, people who make this article a lot better. The negative is it takes a long time. So that a brand new article that you get that, you know, comes in my email that I see was just published, you know, that data was probably collected like two years ago. So um, even new publications are not necessarily new publications. Um, last thing here about research articles, right? Um, if you pick up a journal, that research article is going to have an abstract, which is basically a summary of the whole paper. It's going to have an introduction and review of the literature section. It'll have a method section, a result section, and a discussion section. Um, for this class, you all will write for me an introduction and review of the literature and a method section. Um, and we're going to stop there. We're not going to collect data. We're not going to do anything like that. We'll just write the beginning um, just to give us an idea of what goes into an article. All right, we're going to stop here for right now and pick up with identifying a research topic in the next section.